Thanks for uh, coming to this talk. Um, just before we start, I'd like a show of hands. How many of you have plans uh, or are already running Kubernetes on public clouds? Oh, great. Okay. How many of you would like to save on OpEx costs? Okay. So I think you've come to the right talk. So my name is uh, Big Lee, and um, here's Arun with me. We're from uh, Platform 9. And today we uh, want to discuss uh, ways to um, run Kubernetes clusters on public clouds more cheaply. Okay? And uh, to motivate our talk, let me just give you a quick introduction to what we do at uh, Platform 9. We are in the business of running uh, open source software as a service for our uh, enterprise customers. And we specialize in infrastructure management. Um, and this means we offer Kubernetes, OpenStack, and Fission as an integrated product. And what makes us unique is we run the control plane separately from the data plane so that our customers can run the data plane on the infrastructure of their choice, including uh, bare metal or uh, uh, public cloud instances. And then we host the... Um, control plane, um, and we run it as a service. And we're currently in the process of migrating all of our control plane services from VMs onto uh, containers running on Kubernetes, running on the public cloud. And just like any sane business, um, we are always exploring ways to be super cost efficient without sacrificing our quality of service. So. In our journey, what we've learned and what we've been exploring is, uh, you know, what we've discovered is one of the best ways to reduce costs is to take advantage of um, spot instances on AWS or preemptible instances on Google Cloud, right? They're kind of equivalent. And um, are uh, most of you familiar with uh, the concept of spot instances? We can do a quick review. So spot instances are essentially the same virtual machine instances that you get regularly. Uh, they have the same types, except that they are considerably cheaper from a um, per hour uh, cost, right? And our observations have shown that on average, they can be 60 to 80% uh, lower cost than the regular on-demand instances, right? So the potential savings are huge. However, they come with a drawback, you know, there's a catch to them. And so the issue is bot instances or preemptible can be terminated at any time for reasons that are beyond your control, right? So for example, on AWS, if uh, the real-time price exceeds your bid price, then you can lose the instance. Um, on Google Cloud, they can get terminated for a variety of reasons, but even if nothing happens, after 24 hours, you're guaranteed to lose the instance, but by policy. So what this means is, to really take advantage of spot instances, historically, um, if you're an application developer, you really need to understand the trade-off between uh, availability and price, and kind of match your application to this uh, trade-off. And what this means is typically people have been running specialized workloads on Spot and have required special tooling or scripting to handle node failure, right? So the good news is, fast forward to today, we have Kubernetes. And we think that Kubernetes is going to make spot instances mainstream, right? And why is that? Kubernetes can really hide the complexity and the details of running spot instances because it is really built to handle node failure, right? Under the scenes, it will, for example, leverage uh, public cloud resources like uh, auto-scaling groups that will automatically spin up a new instance if one dies. And at the pod level, if you use the correct constructs like deployment or replica set, if your pod resides on one of those nodes and disappears, Kubernetes will reschedule another pod somewhere else for you. 
And Kubernetes has really taught us to design applications for failure, right? To be resilient with constructs like um, uh, replica sets and services which can distribute requests across a pool of uh, pods so that if you lose a bunch of pods once in a while, no big deal, your application continues to run, right? So we think that Kubernetes and spot instances are really a marriage made in heaven. But the devil's in the details, right? And today, Arun is going to walk us through all the details about how to understand spot instances and how to best take advantage of them within the context of Kubernetes. Thanks, Vic. Um, so let's uh, dig deeper and jump in to see how to save uh, money on your bills. I wanted to uh, look at this uh, blog that Jeff Barr uh, from AWS uh, wrote in 2015. And he spoke about how you choose instances or how you group them into pools. So he spoke about a concept of uh, capacity pool. So this capacity pool is a logical encapsulation uh, of instances that are both standard or on-demand instances and uh, preemptible instances or spot instances. And these instances uh, are pretty much of the same type, so T2 medium. Uh, they are on the same availability zone, and they would belong to the same region. And these capacity pools are attributed uh, to be able to create a instance or launch an instance at any given time for a given price. So what uh, we need to take into account when we choose such capacity pools for our cluster uh, are some of these best practices. So one is when we build our applications, we can make them price aware. So if our applications are built in a way that they don't uh, they are not attached to a particular instance type. Uh, we can choose a specific instance which is of lower cost uh, for running that application. Uh, the other important thing is about checking the history of the instances. So this can be either manual or it can be automated. So it's always nice to go back to history, figure out uh, what the costs are, and then think about which uh, uh, type or which capacity pool would be best to use. Uh, one main important thing is we need to make sure that when we deploy a cluster and choose capacity pools, we, we choose multiple of them. Uh, we compose them of both uh, preemptible instances and spot instances so that our application always uh, runs and our service never goes down. Let's quickly take a look at what Bic mentioned with respect to spot instances in Amazon. Uh, if you look at the graph there, it, it's a M1 medium uh, over three months. I took it out very recently. And you can see that the uh, spot price is always about 80% less than the on-demand price. On-demand is at around 0 0.09, spot price is less than 0 0.02. Uh, if I blow that up, uh, the disadvantage though is that one time or another, this spot instance price or the bid price goes above on-demand price. And that point in time, it doesn't make too much sense to be running things on spot instances. You could switch over to on-demand instances. And, and in EC2, uh, you uh, add a bid price to a spot instance, and normally, if the price goes above that bid price, the instance is terminated. And since Kubernetes handles node failure, Kubernetes kind of works best with such instances. In Google Cloud, it's a little different. It's, it doesn't run on the sur surplus capacity market. Uh, they give you a flat out discount uh, on the price. The only catch is that the instance is, is always terminated somewhere around 24 hours or within 24 hours. The good thing is if it gets terminated within 10 minutes, I think Google does not charge you. So that's the other thing. Let's look at what type of applications would be best suited for such infrastructure. So not all applications work well with spot instances. So one the most common use case is bursting applications. So depending on season, depending on a special occasion, you do have a bunch of traffic. So and that traffic can always be offloaded to uh, spot instances because uh, it goes away and it's ephemeral. Uh, another uh, use case is the HPC uh, industry where the most amount of work you do is number crunching. And, and if these processor or your applications are more or less stateless, 
you can always uh, run them on uh, preemptible instances or spot instances, and it's not too much of a pain if an instance goes down to restart from where it was, where the pod left. Another use case is a highly available clustered apps. So there are still people writing applications in a way that there is one which runs active, and there's another copy of the app running standby, waiting for, uh, waiting to take over in case of the active app going down. So in those cases, again, the standby app would just be syncing, and if it's not participating in an active active configuration, it it can be offloaded to a spot instance and pretty much take lesser of our money than otherwise. Another is the node auto scaling. So the first one is with elastic bursting is you increase or uh, dynamically expand your app. And with expanding app, you will probably need to expand your infrastructure as well. Uh, and horizontal pod order scaling and horizontal node order scaling in Kubernetes pretty much gives you a very good mix to solve this use case. And it's great to work on spot instances. Having said that, let's look at what we can do to deploy clusters uh, with either spot instances or uh, preemptible instances. On GKE, uh, we'll look at GKE, and we'll also look at uh, AWS with respect to KOps. So in GKE, the instance groups uh, are, are also called node pools. So given a node pool, you can specify a type of instance, whether that node pool is going to be preemptible or not. So a catch is that within a node pool, you cannot have a preemptible instance and a fixed instance. It's either or the other. Uh, so the best way to uh, build your app uh, is to have two node pools, one fixed and one preemptible. Uh, to start off with, you can always have a fixed node pool. And then as and when capacity grows, you can add node pools dynamically to the cluster. You can also have node pools with uh, zero nodes in it so that Auto scaling will kick in when your application is uh, needing the capacity. This was one of the examples uh, of an app that I had on GKE, where uh, the, the way I deployed the cluster is created two pools. One is the fixed pool uh, with preemptible in nodes disabled, and the other one is uh, enabling preemptible uh, nodes. And if you go with KOps, uh, KOps uh, has various backends you can deploy clusters across multiple cloud providers with KOps. Uh, I chose this. Since it's an open source tool, uh, let's see how you deploy an, a cluster using KOps and using spot instances. So how KOps does it is, for KOps, the instance group is the uh, binding. And instance group pretty much consists of uh, instances of the same type. So an instance group can either be spot or preemptible uh, or the fixed pool. And uh, when you create a cluster with KOps, it creates uh, multiple instance groups, one for the master node, master components, and one for the nodes or the workers. And these are more, more or less backed by autoscaling groups. So if a node gets terminated within that node, uh, node pool or an instance group, it gets recreated. How many of you have used KOps here? Show of hands. OK. So, and have you used KOps with spot instances by any chance? OK, perfect. So we'll see how to do that in a bit. This is how it looks when you deploy uh, a cluster with KOps on AWS. You, you get an autoscaling group for a master, and uh, you get an autoscaling group for the worker. Uh, in our example, we'll create another instance pool or, or an instance group that uh, are, is a worker type node, and it has uh, spot instances. Uh, KOP uh, YAML file defines the role, and uh, it's defined by either a master or a node. And the only difference between an instance group which is uh, supporting spot instances and an instance group that does not support spot instances or is a fixed uh, instance pool is the max price, uh, what you can see there. So as soon as you uh, uh, add this max price key, uh, the Instance pool that is defined by this YAML becomes uh, a spot instance pool. With KOps, you can uh, add new uh, instance groups. You can also edit instance groups. So one difference between uh, Google GKE and K uh, AWS is GKE, if you create a node pool with preemptible nodes, you cannot change it. You'd need to create a new node pool. 
with K uh, with AWS, you can uh, switch a uh, instance group from preemptible to fixed or fixed to preemptible and so on. So let's quickly take a look at uh, creating a cluster using KOps and spot instances. So what you pretty much do is, first you run AWS configure onto the node uh, and specify the access key, secret key, the region name, and the format that you want all your commands to output in. Once that's done, uh, let's, you can run kop commands. So we just run a kops get cluster. I have already a cluster deployed because cluster deployment takes time. Uh, we'll look at that in a bit. Uh, how do you create a cluster? You run the kops create cluster command, give it a zone uh, and a name. It goes through a bunch of tasks. It assigns a CIDR for that cluster. And then uh, it creates a cluster, a cluster object with all of the resources locally. So you can, it's still not created on AWS. You can go ahead and look at it and manage and modify configuration. So let's quickly take a look at the instance groups that the cluster create went through. So there is a master instance group and a node instance group. Let's quickly change the node instance group to uh, just have one node in it because we'll create a, another pool uh, for the spot instances. So that's done. Let's now create a new instance group using the create IG command. Uh, and the only difference or to do this is to specify a max price. Let's say something like 0 0.08. That's pretty high up there for the T2 medium instance. And that's done. So let's now take a look at the instance groups that we have created. So there is a spot pool that we created. There's a nodes that it created and a master uh, group. We update the cluster with this change of configuration. It's still, all of this is still happening locally. So it's just running through a uh, check to see if all of the configuration that you have done is correct. And as soon as you specify a dash dash yes to the update command, it starts deploying things in, into AWS. So let's quickly look at the AWS uh, console. So this is the cluster that I deployed earlier. Uh, as it will take a bit, and you should see new ones coming up here. But if you look at the spot pool for the launch configuration that, that is responsible to bring up instances in AWS, it, it has a spot price set, and the others don't. So that's, that's the main difference of creating instances or uh, groups in AWS which support spot pricing. I think it should have created the other ones. There you go. It created another one, the, the point eight that we just ran. So it takes about five to six minutes to eight minutes, and the cluster is up, then you should be able to deploy apps on it. Uh, we'll not wait for it. We'll go with another demo. So this is on GKE. We saw AWS. Let's take a look at GKE. Uh, this, take, this demo pretty much uh, shows you how I have multiple pools, a fixed pool and a preemptible pool, and I deploy app, and I create load on it, so it runs a horizontal power order scaler. It creates inst more instances or more nodes for, to support it, but those nodes are created in the uh, preemptible pool and not the fixed pool. And then as soon as the load goes down, it again shrinks. So this is a cluster that I have in GKE. Uh, initially, I had three nodes, a, f a fixed pool with just one node in it, and preemptible pretty much disabled. I have another pool uh, with preemptible enabled, and it can be auto-scaled up to three nodes. And I have another one that uh, is just there. So let's quickly go and deploy a PHP Apache server uh, that, that's going to serve out uh, traffic for us. And we'll also create a busy box or a normal instance where we can start uh, generating traffic for it. Before that, I'm going to create an autoscaler group. And I say that if the load goes above 75%, the horizontal part autoscaling should trigger. And it can trigger to a maximum replicas of eight. So the load is now running. If you look at the bottom right, you can see that the load now is running. And the number of pods uh, that are running for this is just one. 
but the load increased to 223. So the horizontal pod order scaler created multiple instances, but you can see that one of the pod is now in pending state. So that pod is in pending state because it's, it has already run out of resources. Uh, the kubectl describe pod logs is going to show us that it, it didn't happen because of insufficient CPU. The GKE will now automatically trigger a, a node autoscaler, and it creates a new node that from the preemptible pool, and it's, it's getting authorized as part of our Kubernetes cluster. So we had one earlier, and it is two now. As soon as it gets ready, you can, you'll see that the pods now start creating again. And the load should slowly reduce on our app. The load is still there, so it's going to try more creating create more instances till it reaches eight replicas. Uh, and since we had an autoscaler on the node pool set to maximum of three nodes, now we have three preemptible nodes there. And everything is running. The if you look at it, the target now is about 63%, uh, or the the load on the app is 63%. So it's fine. Let's quit the load. Uh, I just quit the load there and. Uh, killed my load generator. You can see that the deployment, uh, the autoscaler deployment target will now fall to zero quickly. And as soon as it falls to zero, you can see that all of the uh, app apps pods are being terminated. And once the app pods are gone, uh, the nodes from the node pool also will get uh, cleaned up by GKE. So you can see that one went away, two went away, and now we are again back to three nodes in our, uh, in our original cluster. So we expanded the cluster for our app during bursted load, and we brought them back down. It takes about five to six minutes for Kubernetes GKE to clean up nodes uh, that are not used, so that's the reason for the demo. Now we saw how you design a cluster to uh, to use spot instances or order scaling. Now we'll look at how you design an application to use spot instances or preemptible instances, because you don't want the application to die completely and not uh, have uh, your service pretty much going down, right? Uh, so some of the application considerations that are required are, is your application stateless or is your application stateful? Uh, if your application is stateless, uh, it is better to, it is a very good match for such a use case. Uh, what about the application replica or distribution of your application? So if you have six pods that is print, uh, backing your application, and all those six pods running on the same preemptible pool may not be a good idea. Definitely not a good idea, because it goes down. Uh, what happens when a node fails? Uh, Kubernetes uh, automatically reschedules those pods to different nodes or instances. And if Kubernetes reschedules them to the preemptible pool again, uh, again, you have a problem that all of the nodes might end up in the preemptible pool, which is also a problem. So uh, there are also cases where applications require specific GPU processing, for example, machine learning or big data analysis. So there, again, preemptible pools might, might be present in your cluster, but you might not want your apps to go and sit in the preemptible pool. So to do this, Kubernetes kind of has a bunch of mechanisms. Uh, I'm sure most of you would have used it. If not, I think you should use it. Uh, one of it is uh, the node selector. So nodes come with labels, or you can apply labels to nodes. Uh, and you could use that as a node selector when you deploy your application to say if your pods go to that particular node or not. Uh, now, let's say, for example, you need to deploy an application on this uh, cluster with preemptible instances and fixed instances. So one way of deploying this, or one example, is uh, I have two deployment specs of my same app, uh, just an Nginx server. Uh, I deploy one on the preemptible pool by specifying the GKE preemptible true. And I deploy the other, uh, the, uh, the other part of my apps, or it's the same app, but another deployment, onto the fixed pool using the node selector uh, using the name of the node pool. So GKE, when you create node pools, it, add la it adds labels to those node pools. And for instances that are preemptible, they come with a label inbuilt, and that's the GKE-preemptible equal to true label. So what are the supporting mechanisms here? So let's look at uh, another example, right? Uh, the HA app that we were talking about. 
so let's say we have two, no two node pools. Uh, we have a bunch of apps running on them. Uh, we want to deploy this HA app, uh, and we have one copy or one deployment already deployed to the fixed pool. And now we want to deploy the, uh, deploy the, uh, the other one, passive one, standby one, to the uh, preemptible node pool. So the way you can do that is by using a, a node affinity. Uh, and the, uh, the type of node affinity that you would use is something called the required during scheduling, ignored during exception. Basically, what it says is uh, deploy this app only to the preemptible node pool and not the fixed node pool, and vice versa. So if there's another app that I would like to run on my preemptible node pool, but I'm OK if my preemptible node pool is full, uh, I would use the preferred uh, during scheduling, ignoring during exception type for the node affinity. Uh, if you want to uh, make sure that your apps are on different AZs for high availability, there is another label that you could use, which is the failure domain uh, label with the slash zone that tells you which zone your uh, node is running on. So you could have affinity or anti-affinity for your app for that particular zone. Let's quickly take a look at the uh, node selector or the application availability. It's basically how you deploy an app to uh, these clusters. So what I do is uh, I have my application like uh, the way you saw it. Uh, I have two deployment specs, the fixed deployment spec and the preemptible deployment flex. It's just going to deploy the Nginx server. And the main difference that uh, each of these spec have is that one is node selected to the fixed pool, and the preemptible one is node selected to the preemptible pool. Uh, I just have an init container there which uh, adds this uh, echo statement to the index HTML, which tells us which part is going to be replying. That's for us to figure out in the demo. There is a service that's going to front both of this. So there is one service, but two deployments. Uh, th there are two Nginx deployments, one on preemptible, one on fixed. But there is just one service that fronts all of this. So that's how uh, you, you can uh, make use of the service, but not worry about where it's running. I also have a small uh, busy box that generates load. From where I can generate load or uh, curl. So let's quickly run into uh, deploy this. So. Okay, there is nothing. So let's deploy them, all of them. <sighs> Typing. So all of them are running. So I have uh, Nginx, uh, one Nginx server running on the fixed pool. I have two of the other instances running on two different preemptible pools. Uh, let's look at the service. And let's go in and start uh, running some load on it. And let's do a while true. Let's do a wget and the cluster IP. I'm on VPN, so <laughs> 1055, 248, 133. We always need a sleep there. Yeah, Mr. Lu. OK. Ooh, oops. Oh, that was a quite, not a P. OK. So we are getting 
uh, our responses from both parts, <coughs> running on preemptible and fixed. Let's go and uh, terminate our uh, preemptible pool. Let's, let's assume that the preemptible pool kind of dies. Internet, come on. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the GCE. And let's terminate the flexible instances. So you can see that the it takes a, a bunch of time for the service to reconfigure for pods going down. But then you have the uh, pod on the fixed instance running and responding. And I think live demo. <laughs> but yeah, so as soon as the preemptible instances come back up, we will start getting responses from the preemptible pool as well. I think I might have deployed the curler on the preemptible pool as well. <laughs> that might be the reason I might have lost this. That's fine. So that's, that's the demo where basically you use node selector and affinity, node affinity to deploy apps in the right place. We'll quickly go back. I had an interesting uh, experiment that we ran. Uh, just had a two node cluster, one uh, basically a split 50-50%, one on preemptive and one on fixed. Uh, ran on GKE for 12 days, no active workloads. <laughs> and uh, one in, in, uh, observation th that we saw was the uh, preemptible node uh, goes away somewhere around 24 hours in the median time. It's almost, sometimes it's a little more than 24 hours, otherwise it's normally around 24 hours. And the most imp important thing, most the reason why you're here is the costs. So if you look at the total cost or the bill that I got for the 12 days for the two instances is $16. And if you replace this preemptible custom in, uh, instance core with a standard instance, uh, the total would be around $24. So cost saving is about $8 for 12 days just for two nodes and no workloads. So if you uh, just do a mental experiment and scale it up, the cost saving somewhat looks like around $13,000 for a year for 50 nodes on fixed and 50 nodes on preemptible. So that, that's the interesting figure that we, we are seeing. And it will definitely increase as you increase the number of nodes or, the, or reduce your fixed, fixed node prices. That's about it uh, that I had. So hopefully one key takeaway that I think you, should, you could take away from this is uh, using spot instances is beneficial. It would reduce your costs. But there are two things that you need to take care of. One is to architect the cluster. And the second is to architect your app. And doing this, both of this a good, in a good way can get you quite a bit of savings in terms of uh, bill. And Kubernetes is the best for this approach. And yeah, that was it for me. Thanks, Rick. We can take maybe one uh, or two questions. questions. So a great presentation. Thank you. Um, definitely an introduction into it. I agree with you. I think Kubernetes it really gives us a chance to take care of these spot and interruptible instances. It gets really complicated on AWS, and things keep changing. So like they just recently changed their pricing structure. They even went from hour to per second. Yep. And every time we have a strategy put together, it seems like it changes dynamically. Right. So that's actually what motivated me to try to encapsulate this into a service so that people that don't have a team of 12 people to go off and do that can still leverage and get benefits from these. But the key points is to make sure your application can survive. And one other point I think you missed is that even though pods recover, you still don't want them going down a lot. So at least for the spot instances, you can actually detect that and tell them to start draining and try yep. to move things off there. So that's another important piece. Yes. And the last one is diversify across multiple instance types, just like a yep. stock plan. Yep. But 
interesting. Yes. Thanks for the comments. So I saw you used COPS, um, which is cool. Uh, I'm not using COPS. So are there any other tools to use uh, spot or preemptible um, instances with like a service I can run on Kubernetes to monitor that kind of stuff, or I don't know? Good question. So COPS is uh, pretty popular out there, so I use that, and it had spot instance support. Uh, Platform 9, we do spot instances. Uh, I would want to say kubeadm does it, but I'm not sure that it, that is yet. Uh, if anybody with kubeadm knowledge could talk about it. But yeah, COPS is one I know that does spot instances. OK, that's uh, all we have time for. Uh, feel free to talk to us uh, on the side. Thanks. <laughs>